Hello, I'm Bob Yandy, and today we're going to take a look at the communion elements, and we're going to interweave divine healing and the forgiveness of sins together in a way you've never seen before. Anxious? So am I. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. So great to have you here today. I'm going to get to one of my favorite subjects today, which is divine healing, which is going to be a one-timer. But I had a tough question given me one time, and I'll talk about it today on the broadcast that kind of threw me back because I was raised in a Pentecostal home. My father was a Pentecostal minister, and I was taught from a very, very young age about divine healing. It was just part of the lifestyle that we uh, lived. When I was a young boy, a sharp pain hit me in the stomach. I was probably only four or five years old. I doubled over on the floor in pain. And my father prayed for me in the name of Jesus. You know what? Immediately I was healed. And not only in our family there, but as I've raised children of my own, I've been times where my wife has been sick, my kids have been sick, I've been sick. We prayed over each other and we've seen the healing power of God come. Loretta and I trained our children to know and trust Jesus as their healer as well as their savior. And I've seen the power of God heal both of my children from heart trouble to fevers, cooling under our hands. We laid hands on my daughter one time whose head was just burning. And we both at the same time felt that fever just totally disappear and her head become cool. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer, has been a covenant name that we've depended on for our family's health since all the way back to the Old Testament where that name was given. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what I'm offering on this broadcast will be on the subject of divine healing because I don't wanna just cover this in just one lesson. Healing just covers so much of the Word of God. It's such a tremendous uh, thing because Jesus died on the cross to bring us not only salvation, but to bring us healing also. It is so wrapped up in the work of Jesus on the cross, it becomes a very important issue. And actually, healing becomes a major way of us witnessing to the world. Jesus used divine healing as a means of witnessing, and so it is with the disciples. From the time that Jesus sent them out, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, cast out devils. These things were used to help win people over to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul in chapter 15 of the book of Romans said that when he came to them that he preached the gospel fully. He said, I have fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem around about unto Illyricum because he said that uh, signs and wonders accompanied his ministry. And he called that fully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It simply comes back to this. If signs and wonders don't follow your ministry, you're not fully preaching the gospel. You're preaching the gospel by sharing Jesus. And that's wonderful. That's part of it. But the gospel is to be shared by word and by deed. And this is how Jesus did it, how the disciples did it. And so on top of that, not just ministering to the sinner that way, because after Jesus healed multitudes, it said many believed on him which means what? Many didn't believe on him. Jesus didn't ask them if they were a Christian first or a believer first, and then he would heal them. He healed everybody that came to him. In fact, it said he healed every sickness and every disease among all the people, Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter nine, and we could go on on Matthew chapter eight, just, just uh, chapter after chapter and verse after verse of what Jesus did. So I've ministered as a teacher of the word of God for years, been the pastor of a church. I pastored for 33 years, taught in a Bible school for four years, years. And since the time I've stepped down from pastoring, I have taught in Bible schools, conferences and everywhere, and just seen the miracle power of God, the healing power of God. I've ministered as a teacher of the word of God. I've been seeing many people healed of minor sicknesses, incurable diseases. There was a young girl, four years old, I prayed for that was in a coma and she came out of that coma. I could go on and on and on with the wonderful power, the wonderful love, the wonderful grace of the Lord in healing. But I can tell you this, this belief hasn't gone unchallenged because really, honestly, to tell you from the time that I stepped into the ministry, I wanted to teach more than just being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues, divine healing, and the things that surround Pentecostal belief. I, I'm saturated in that, but being having a desire to see more of the word of God, I would go back and study after fundamentalists and the fundamentalist would be, I mean, I could have, I could find some of the most incredible books describing some of the most incredible verses of scripture, bringing out things I've never seen before. But it's almost like these guys shifted back to being a child in a chapter that they went after the gifts of the spirit or against divine healing. 
actually calling people who believe in divine healing demon possessed. I'd have to go look in the mirror and say, Bob, are you demon possessed? They're saying this about you, that if you believe in divine healing or that divine healing ended by the time the Bible was written, and the, and the New Testament was finished and the book of Revelation was closed that by that time the word of God was complete so God didn't need divine healing, the gifts of the spirit or speaking with tongues anymore. In other words, the supernatural ladder was pulled up into heaven and we have been left with just one thing, the word of God. But we've also been left with the Holy Spirit. Both of these two agree. And we find the word of God becomes what trains us and instructs us, but the, but the spirit of God is what gives us power to get it done. I have been given authority. I have been given authority over Satan and demons and the works of the devil, including sickness and disease, but I don't, I'm not the one that heals them. I have that authority, but I can't do it without the name of Jesus. So again, my belief in divine healing has not gone unchallenged. It's been challenged for years from book pages, open confrontations where I've talked with people. I've been challenged by other born again ministers that healing is not part of the atoning work of Jesus, even though they have found the word of God to speak for itself. Matthew 8, 17, quoting Isaiah 53, for himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And Jesus in that chapter, this was a small parenthetical verse of scripture describing what was happening as he cast out devils and healed multitudes of every sickness and every disease among all the people. And then also Isaiah 53 and verse five is quoted in 1 Peter 2, 24, that with his stripes we are and were healed. So I've become stronger in my knowledge that forgiveness of sins and healing of the body go hand in hand. Psalm 103 verse three says, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. Notice how that even in a believer's life, these two are attached together, that God wants to heal you of your sicknesses, but he also wants to forgive you of your diseases. That's James chapter five and verse 15. And Jesus explained that healing of sickness is an outward proof of his ability to forgive sins, Matthew chapter nine, verses five through seven, that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say to this man, arise, take up your bed and walk. Divine healing is still exactly that today, an outward proof of God's ability to remove sin from your life. You know, the amazing thing is, uh, even though there's denominations who don't believe in speaking with tongues, don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit today, all have to honestly admit, whether it's in magazines or whether it's in private conversations, that the ones that are winning the most souls throughout the world are Pentecostal movements, Pentecostal churches, Pentecostal assemblies. And they seem to, they say, we don't understand how this can be, but it simply comes back to this. Jesus did not evangelize in every case, simply by preaching and teaching, although he did that, but most of all, he did it through healing. And he brought in the sick, they brought him from everywhere, because why? As Kenneth Hagin said years ago, that healing is the dinner bell for the gospel. So basically after a number of years, pastoring even for a number of years, I thought all my questions were answered. And all the arguments that I had been brought against were explained. I thought I had heard every argument until I heard one minister say, I was actually listening to a tape one day, a cassette. You remember cassettes? I was listening to a cassette one day of a noted minister in this country. And he said this, he didn't believe in divine healing, but really he caught me off guard when he said this, because if I'd known he was headed in toward a renunciation of healing, I'd have just zipped past it and gone past it. I thought I'd heard every argument until I heard this argument. Here's what he said. If healing was really part of the atoning work of Jesus, on the cross, then whenever a person believes in Jesus as his savior, all of his sicknesses should leave his body. And since a person can be just as sick after they've been born again as before they were born again, this proves there is no healing in the atonement. I had never heard that. I thought, what am I gonna do with this one? So I thought about it and begin to study it out. I thought, you know what? I'm still gonna preach divine healing because I believe in, it's not the healing that's wrong, it's this question he has. It's this viewpoint he came up with that somehow, even though it sounds logical, something is wrong with this. So the answer to the question, I began to study and study and brought me to a place I would have never suspected. It brought me to the communion elements. Isn't that interesting, the communion elements? And so let's talk about the communion elements. And while you're turning to other verses of scripture that I'm going to be talking about here in just a moment, that I want you to uh, understand that 
the things about divine healing, all these things are brought out in the word of God. But I wanna to talk to you for just a moment about those of you who are watching today, maybe for the first time. Thank you for joining with me. I want you to understand that I appreciate the fact that you tuned in today. And for those, this may be your fourth, fifth, or sixth broadcast you're watching. Thank you for just getting hooked on it. You all like it. You're telling your friends about it. Uh, there's one area of the country we went on on the, on the West Coast, and uh, I was so excited to get on there. And from the first day that broadcast was on, we got a letter from a lady, and she joined and became a partner with us. And she's from Sacramento. And just, uh, again, amazed me that just the first day the broadcast was on, she listened to it and was hooked that fast on it and became a partner with us from the very beginning. So again, I think this is wonderful. This just tells how there is, there's a desire out there for people to hear the instruction of the word of God, even opened up line upon line and precept upon precept and taught. So again, I thank you. And for those like her who have joined me as a partner, some don't join from the first time they hear. They wait until they've heard for a while, then they decide, I'm going to do this. Some, the Holy Spirit speaks to them. Others, just as they purpose in their heart, they decide to be a partner with me, and I thank you for it. Because all the things I have, this wonderful studio, the ministry I have, the mailing list, all these things, and the, the staff that I have here are all made possible because of those who have committed to giving on a monthly basis. If you'd like to become a partner with me, then go to bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there on our website where you too can become a partner with me. And so again, thank you ahead of time for joining me as a partner. So let's talk about this for just a moment. I said it brought me to the communion elements. I wanna talk about rituals for the church age. There were rituals in the Old Testament. Every ritual of the Old Testament pointed forward to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every ritual today points back to the work of Jesus on the cross. In fact, I love Isaiah that says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the thing about it is those us's were 500 years before the cross, but they claim the crosses for themselves. We're even told when Jesus healed, his, healed those around him and forgave sins, it was based on what he would do just actually a few years in advance. I mean, his public ministry only lasted three years, but he started out his public ministry with signs and wonders and miracles and then pointed out in Matthew chapter eight, early in his healing ministry, early in his public ministry, that this was a fulfillment of what he would do on the cross. So anything up until the cross pointed forward to the cross, after the cross, everything points back to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I like to think of it this way. On the cross, Jesus' two hands were spread out, one toward the Old Testament, one toward the New Testament. And Jesus, in essence, all those sins that were committed kept being rolled off and rolled off and rolled off. And even though there were sacrifices in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, but were a sign of the one that could. And when Jesus went to the cross, he forgave every sin, past, present, and future. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Today, we live after the cross, and we look back to what Jesus did for us on the cross, including the fact that he healed us. But the healing on the cross actually went backward too, back to the Old Testament, and that's what Isaiah 53 has told us. When we get back after halftime, we'll continue with this. I'll see you right after the break. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyendian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, 
visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. I know that the announcer told you about the book that we're offering and the series that we're offering, which is The Grace of Healing. But the reason why I'm teaching this day is the last chapter in the book. I really bring it all the way down to this about the importance of communion today. You know, unlike the Old Testament, there were many forms of ritual in the Old Testament. I mean, there were so many of them. We read them in the law, we read them in the sacrifices, all the different forms of ritual they had. And so there were, but when Jesus went to the cross and said, it is finished, he was not referring to the plan of salvation. He was referring to the law. The plan of salvation wasn't complete until Jesus went to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That's why he sat down because the work was complete. But when Jesus said just before he died, it is finished, he was referring to the law and the sacrifices. He fulfilled every jot and every tittle. In fact, in, in chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews in verse five, it said, when Jesus came into the world, that's when he was born in the world and actually in the manger said this, he said, sacrifice and offering you would not you didn't desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And he says, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to fulfill. He came to fulfill the Old Testament types and shadows, everything, and even said one day, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. Well, he didn't totally fulfill it again till he went to the cross and there on the cross, the last of it was done. And then the entire plan of salvation was completed when he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But man, there were so many forms of ritual. It takes chapter after chapter and verse after verse to tell of all the rituals of the Old Testament. We are not under those rituals, but those rituals are there for our admonition, our teaching. In fact, a good minister of the word, a good pastor, a good Bible school instructor will take you back and show you how each one of those different sacrifices, even the furniture, all those things described in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 9, those chapters literally deal with the, with the tabernacle and the temple and all the different things that were in there and what they stand for. And so again, that's very important, but all those things have been fulfilled. We can study them today, but thank God we're not under it. Aren't you glad you don't have to bring a bullock to church? I bet your pastor's even happier because he doesn't have to slay the thing. So the point of it is, is all those were done back there, but we do still have forms of ritual in the New Testament. And in fact, there are three of them. So unlike the Old Testament, which there were hundreds and hundreds of different type of ritual in the New Testament, we have three. The three types of ritual for the church age are number one, water baptism. And God instructs this, even commands it right after we're born again. It is not a part of, of salvation, but it is an open display and an open witness to the world around us that we have been born again. Number two is anointing for oil for healing. And this is found in James chapter five. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And the, the third one we're talking about, which is communion. And so the types of ritual given today don't point to the future as the Old Testament uh, ones did, but back to the finished work of Jesus Christ in redemption. It's important to understand that it's never the ritual that has the power, but what the ritual stands for. Jesus said of the communion elements, do this in remembrance of me. Some people actually try to dissect each one of these, you know, like water baptism or anointing with oil or the communion elements. They try to really divide it out and they try to get so specific on everything that the importance in each one of them, whenever you have a ritual today in the New Testament, the issue is not the ritual or keeping up with exactly every element that should be there or you think should be there. It comes back to this, it's the remembrance. That ritual brings a remembrance to our mind and that remembrance is what brings us healing, deliverance, all the things that God wants us to have. So just, just take for a moment water baptism. Some people are convinced they should be baptized in river water, running water. Some are saying, well, no, no, it should be running water because that's what the Jordan River was. And some even to be further convinced they should be baptized in the Jordan River in Israel. I remember when we went to the Jordan River, there were so many there, some who'd never been water baptized said, no, 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 I've been waiting for this. I've been praying for this and saving for this trip because I don't want to be water baptized in a, in a baptismal in church, I want to be baptized in the Jordan River. I think this is exactly what should be done. Well, what about people that can't afford to go there? On top of that, again, the Jordan River was just where the Jesus went because it was close. It was the place. But it really doesn't matter. God doesn't care if you're baptized in a swimming pool. We had a church where we had a swimming pool. This is where the water baptisms took place or even a bathtub. It's not the place or the type of water. It's what baptism stands for that has the meaning. The ritual shows that the person has already accepted Jesus as their savior. The water symbolizes death 
and burial of their old life. And then the coming out of the water represents resurrection to newness of life. And you walk off in newness of life. This is what it shows. You are showing the people there that by being put under the water, you died with Jesus, rose with him, and now you walk off in newness of life. Because why? What does water baptism represent? It represents identification. I was identified with Jesus in his crucifixion, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and then a finally his ascension into heaven and even sitting at the right hand of the Father. Because where am I right now? I am seated with him in heavenly places. Many believers are convinced the local church should use olive oil when laying hands on the sick for healing. The church as I was raised in did, but you know what? Nobody made a deal out of it. In fact, I'm sure if you were somewhere and didn't have anointing oil or some church that didn't have it, you know, uh, uh, olive oil, if they ran out, it really doesn't matter. And it's true that this was probably what was used in the times of the New Testament, but God is not concerned with the type of oil. It's not the oil that heals the sick, but the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. The oil represents the Holy Spirit's power for healing because oil is usually representing the word of God as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So the oil represents the Holy Spirit, his presence to heal. And so in other words, also that the laying on of hands is is not important in healing, but the faith. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick, the Lord will raise him up. Even hands, my hands don't have God's power in it. My hands are the place where God's power can flow through, but my hands are just normal hands. The Holy Spirit is often called in the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord. You understand what that's saying? So my hand represents the power of the Holy Spirit, My hand represents the hand of the Lord, which is the Holy Spirit. So when I lay hands on a person, I don't tell them my hand will make you whole. No, the prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. And it's the hand of the Lord that raises them up. Always a symbol of the miraculous in the Old Testament. So again, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, his presence to heal. I could point out that the hands are not important, but the healing and the the, uh, ministry of faith. Some people want hands laid them on by a famous minister. The hands are only an individual represent the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is the divine power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and it will work through the hands of any believer. So it really comes down to this. It doesn't matter if it's motor oil or Crisco. It really doesn't matter, even though you might say, yeah, but I had, you know, I had real olive oil placement. That's fine. But you know what? It didn't matter. Olive oil won't heal you, but the Holy Spirit will and his power will. In communion, many people argue whether to have real wine or grape juice. And believe me, this is an argument around the world. I have been in countries that don't use anything but real grape juice. And in fact, my wife and I were in Latvia one time and everyone drank out of the same cup. I mean, this gigantic cup was passed from person to person. And I mean, the pastor there of this church was from the United States. In fact, from here in Tulsa, and he told us, I'm going to make sure you and you and Loretta get the first sip out of it because I didn't want to be, I mean, we looked around this place and my, I was grinning, but mine was, my mind was going, oh my God, I don't want to be number 55 that drinks out of this thing or 50. So he lets us drink first. Okay. And he did that, and he, but presented as, as a means of reverence toward us that we're grateful that Bob has come over here to minister to us. So in communion, people argue whether to have real wine or grape juice and unleavened bread or regular bread. I'm listening to me. God doesn't care if you use root beer and Twinkies. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, Luke 22, 19. Remember, it's not the element, it's the remembrance of Jesus. What good does it do if the elements are right, but you don't have faith and trust in Jesus? The element should remind you that that in communion, we have wine that speaks of the blood of Jesus, but we also have bread that speaks of the broken body of Jesus Christ. And the wine speaks of salvation and the bread speaks of the miracles of Jesus that by his stripes we were healed, the breaking open of his flesh. Keeping your attention on the finished work of the cross is what will bring the miracle power, forgiveness, and divine healing. The cup and the bread are merely a point of contact for the release of faith in the power of God, and there is no merit in the element the merit is in the remembrance. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29, for he who eats and drinks unworthily, that means your sin in your life, eats and drinks judgment to himself. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. Notice this, 
It goes on to say, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many die early. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and 30. Look at verse 30 for just a moment. For this cause, many are weak and sick among you. What cause? Not discerning the Lord's body in the previous verse. Notice it's by his body we are healed not by his blood. By the blood came forgiveness of sins. The blood is always used in the forgiveness of sins, whether it's a sinner or whether it's a saint. In both cases, for a sinner to receive Jesus as Savior or for a saint to come back into fellowship with the Lord, it requires the blood of Jesus Christ. But healing came by the stripes of Jesus on his body. This is what the bread stands for. These believers were partaking unworthily and unworthy manner because they were not properly understanding the meaning of the communion table. They were taking lightly the meaning of the bread and the cup and the communion elements turned to a full meal. And then after that developed into a drunken party and Paul had to come to them and tell them not to do this. So communion is different than any other ritual we have in the church today. Why? It speaks directly of the work of Jesus on the cross. Baptism has water, anointing with oil has oil, but communion has two elements, and that is bread and wine. So we come back to this again. The two elements don't reappear from the word of God back in the Old Testament where Melchizedek met Abraham until Jesus came along. And Jesus, our king priest, said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Paul told us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. So we come down to it. And that was, what does the word of God have to say to us about the purpose of divine healing? What does the healing here simply have to do with it? Faith is the release of receiving both salvation and divine healing. And faith is all that's necessary for the forgiveness of sins, but also the accomplishment of what Jesus did for us on the cross to heal us of our sickness and their disease. So what it comes back to is this simply this, it's a simple solution. We come back to the question, if Jesus atoned for our sickness as well as our sins on the cross, then why are we not healed when we accept Jesus as our savior? The solution is simple. The two communion elements are taken separately not both at the same time. After I realized this, I thought it's wrong to actually stick the, uh, the bread into the cup and mix the two together. No, you partake of the bread, then you partake of the cup. So receiving Jesus Christ for healing is separate from receiving him as Lord and Savior. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. So it simply comes back to this. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you drank of the cup but you didn't eat the bread. It's time now to receive Jesus Christ as your personal healer and receive the bread into your life, understanding this, that by his stripes, I was healed. Have a great day. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.